Hi guys, in this video we're going to explore the concept of texture transition, a fundamental technique for producing interesting materials. Since it isn't always possible or convenient to have big and unique textures per asset, most of the time more and smaller textures are blended inside the shader to achieve a high quality result. Knowing how to properly create good transitions between those textures is key to the development of convincing materials. At the core of every transition there usually is the linear interpolation function. This node outputs a value between the one inputted in A and the one inputted in B, proportionally to the given alpha value. The more the alpha value approaches zero, the more the output approaches the A value. The more it approaches 1, the more the output approaches the B value. It's also possible to use alpha values outside the 0-1 range. In this case, the output value is, we could say, exaggerating its B extreme. To understand what's happening, you have to imagine the colors as 3D vectors in space, with the XYZ coordinates equal to the color RGB components. The LERP node creates an infinite line that passes through A and B. The alpha value decides which point value is used as output from said line, where 0 corresponds to A, 1 corresponds to B, any value between 0 and 1 is a point on the line between A and B, any negative value is a point on the A side of the line, any positive value greater than 1 is a point on the B side of the line. Of course, the same thing applies when textures are used as inputs. As you can see, when using textures, alpha values outside the 0-1 range don't make sense regarding the visual result. So in these cases, make sure to have your alphas in the 0-1 range. To create a transition with the LERP node, the constant value assigned to the alpha input must be changed with a known constant one. For example, we could use the R channel of the mesh UVs. Now the A value is outputted where the channel value is 0, and the B value is outputted where the channel value is 1. All the in-between values are blended accordingly. The base concept of texture transition is as simple as this. What makes a transition interesting and appealing depends on how the alpha gradients are computed and from which data are generated. As just shown, UV values can be used to generate a useful gradient for this purpose. In fact, it isn't rare at all to add additional UV channels to mesh exclusively as baked data to be used for some texture blending. Moreover, it's also possible to use the UVs to map a texture which contains in one of its channels the alpha gradient we need. Another type of mesh data often used for this purpose is the vertex color. This is particularly useful since the mesh can be imported with its vertex color, like the UV channels but a real engine has also an internal tool to paint the vertices in editor. So, by using a one vertex color channel as alpha, it's possible to create a paintball material.
As you can see, where I paint a value of 0, my A texture shows up. Where I paint a value of 1, the B texture comes out. As previously mentioned, a good transition is made by the data on which it's based, but also on how such data is processed. For example, we may want to change the transition contrast. Or have it happen at different times on the gradient. Or also need to combine more than one transition to obtain what we want. We could even use a noise texture to break the boring linearity of our gradient. As for the workspace mapping, we are not bound to play only with the mesh data. We can also use the world data to generate a lot more interesting alphas. To continue the analogy with my previous video, we could consider using the vertices word position to generate a transition. Let's take the Z axis as alpha and display it. As you can see, the emissive shows us a very high value. This is because our gradient is not in 0-1 range. So, as previously said, let's add a saturate node. Now we have correct values, but no smooth transition between them. If we look closer, we notice instead that the gradient is there indeed. It's just very small. This is because a unit in a real engine is 1 cm long, so our 0 1 range values are crammed in that tiny space. We can control the size of the gradient if, before clamping the workspace values, we divide them by the length we want our transition to be. Moreover, we could control the height at which the transition occurs by subtracting it before the division we just added. Now, her mesh can be placed anywhere in the world, but the transition will happen only at the height we decided. We can also make the transition local to the mesh by subtracting the object position height from the work position. The transition is still in work space, but positioned relatively to the mesh pivot at which the shader is applied. Another data often used for material transition is the workspace vertex normal. With it, you can create all sorts of transitions related to geometry phasing. For example, if we isolate the z-axis here too, and we slice it as alpha, we have a transition that applies the more a vertex is facing upwards.
Of course, we can do this with any axis. Moreover, like for workspace mapping, we can use a custom vector to have the transition in any direction we desire. To do that, we'll need the dot node. You can think of the output of the dot product as something that tells the shader how much the vectors are pointing in the same direction, where white means that they are perfectly aligned, black that they are perpendicular to each other. When the vectors are perfectly opposite, the output is negative 1. Remember that this is true only when both the input vectors are normalized. Since the mesh vertex normals are already normalized, we will add the normalized node only to our parameter. Let's take a look at this mesh I shaded applying all the examples I explained in this video. The vertex color is used to blend two different tiling materials across all the surface, to avoid texture repetition. Workspace position data is used to place dirt only at the bottom, near the floor. Workspace Vertex Normal and Ambient Occlusion data are used to place MOS directionally. As you can see, a very simple concept can be expressed in many shapes. The only limits are creativity and knowledge of the instrument you are using. However, there are some texture blending techniques that are more complicated and particular, which will be discussed in future videos.